with fine trees and beautiful mansions. Their thirst for power and blood set them on a course for destruction. When it finally came, their annihilation would be swifter and more complete than the world had ever known. In 1825 AD, central Mexico, near modern-day Mexico City. A young girl, just a teenager, is celebrating her impending wedding. She is the daughter of a tribal king, and she is about to join a new tribe that has been a guest of her kingdom. That tribe is now known as the Aztecs. As part of the ritual, five Aztec noblemen lead her to an ancient temple for the ceremony. But as she reaches the top, the noblemen suddenly veer her away from the altar and onto a slab of stone in front of the temple, one used for sacrifice. Each man holds a limb, while a fifth lifts an obsidian knife high in the air. With one searing move, he slashes it through her chest and extracts her still beating heart. That evening, the king is invited to a ceremony to celebrate the marriage. Instead, he finds a priest performing a dance, wearing the still glistening skin of his daughter. As part of the ritual, the Aztecs had flayed her to honor the god of fertility. He saw this, and he was absolutely horrified at what he saw, his dear daughter. And so he and his forces immediately chased the, the Aztecs into the lake and onto this island where they sought refuge. The marshy island was an unwelcoming place. Yet it was from here that the Aztecs would beat the odds against them and forge the most powerful empire of the Americas. Hi, I'm Peter Weller. When I think of the Aztecs, I think of an elegant people with beautiful skin and flamboyant headdresses of many colors, and I think of floating cities and a terrific song by Neil Young about Moctezuma and Cortez. But I also think of knives, of obsidian glass ripping into chest cavities and hands, pulling out bleeding hearts and holding them high. Most of the Aztec sacrifices were performed in a temple atop a stone pyramid like this one. The Aztecs felt that without these offerings, the sun would literally cease to rise and the universe would die. Now, Aztec history is a fusion of fact and myth. But what we do know is that this murder, as horrific as it was, not only marked the beginning of the Aztec Empire, it also marked the location from where it would rise. The island the Aztecs were banished to after their disastrous sacrifice of the princess was in Lake Texcoco, the largest of five interconnected lakes covering a valley about 40 by 70 miles. Today, this once vast and open valley is teeming with what is modern-day Mexico City, one of the largest cities in the world. But 700 years ago, the island was so swampy, no one had laid claim to it. Now, as they gazed on the lake, the Aztec leader Tenoch announced to his followers that he had seen an eagle perched on a cactus in the middle of the lake, a sign from the gods that they had found their new home. They would name their city Tenochtitlan. Life is tough for the Aztecs in the early days of Tenochtitlan, but they have a vision. A vision of a powerful city modeled on an ancient and legendary city just 25 miles away. They called this city Teotihuacan, or City of the Gods. We know very little about Teotihuacan because all we have is the archaeological remains. We don't have any writing, we don't have any documentation that, that really fleshes out what went on at this big city. It was in ruins, even in Aztec times, but they believed it to be the stomping grounds of the gods, 
and the literal birthplace of the sun itself. The place the Aztecs most revered in Teotihuacan was a pyramid that rose above the tree line. It was called the Pyramid of the Sun. The massive sun pyramid contains a million cubic yards of earth and stone, with a base roughly the same as the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. The Aztecs believed Teotihuacan was laid out in the image of the cosmos created by their gods. Now it was this image they would attempt to replicate in the construction of their new city, Tenochtitlan. Taking on the challenge would be an Aztec leader named Acamapichtli. In 1376, he embarked on an ambitious plan to engineer an advanced city at Tenochtitlan. But there was a problem. The swampy islands that they took over needed a lot of work. When they started to build anything, it would begin to subside. There was simply no foundation on which to build. The Aztec's solution would revolutionize the architecture of the Americas. They began by anchoring their buildings deep in the ground using a system of pilings made from wood. Workers cut stakes into 30-foot lengths, three to four inches wide. These were driven into the soft ground to make a foundation. The pilings were often surrounded with volcanic stone to add strength. Masons and bricklayers could then build walls on top of this base with confidence. They have found wooden pylons to hold the foundations of the, of the pyramids. The fact that they didn't sink or the fact that it didn't just topple. I think that's a major feat of engineering. Tenochtitlan was an island city, but the lakes surrounding it were very shallow, sometimes only seven feet deep. The whole thing looked like a giant metroplex floating on a pond. Originally, the only way to get from this floating city to the mainland was by boat. But the Aztecs eventually devised a series of causeways, sometimes 45 feet wide, that would connect their floating city to the mainland provinces. The causeway was supported by strong wooden pilings, the same pilings that supported their temples and other buildings. Thousands of these pilings had to be driven deep into the lake bed, and this presented a logistical challenge that could only be met by a strong, skilled labor force and the best of Mesoamerica's engineers. To build a causeway, two lines of stakes were laid out. Then the space between them was filled with stones and earth until it reached several feet above the water level. This allowed the road to support enormous weight. These causeways were built very straight. Uh, they were very wide with bridges that would open up uh, that connected the city to the north, to the west, and to the south. The roads enabled the Aztecs to transport larger, heavier materials for building. But this presented a new challenge. There were no beasts of burden in Mesoamerica, so everything had to be done with humans no carts no wheel small loads would be carried on the back with a rope hung from the forehead large items like stone blocks or sculptures for a temple would be dragged by huge numbers of men pulling ropes possibly using logs as rollers legend has it one stone bound for a temple required a force of 50,000 men to drag it from the mountains on the mainland across the causeway and into the city the causeways would also present the Aztecs with a new way to get fresh water to Tenochtitlan. In the past, the Aztecs had transported water in canoes from the shore. But a huge boom in the city's population meant they needed a higher tech solution to keep up with demand. They wanted to use water from the springs on the mainland, and so they wanted to build an aqueduct. But the springs were under control of the dominant tribe in the region, the ruthless Tepaniks. The Tepaniks were the controllers or the dominators of all the valley. They had a, a, a very strong empire. So they were the lords of the valley. So the Aztecs were tributary subjects to them. As the Aztec population grew, tensions with the Tepaniks began to simmer. Now the Aztecs decided to issue an ultimatum that could change the balance of power in the region. The 
people of Tenochtitlan not only demanded that the Tepanex give them the water, but also demanded that they help construct the aqueduct. The Tepanex answer was swift and brutal. The Tepanex king, Maxtala, sent assassins who murdered the reigning Aztec leader in cold blood. This was the final straw. After decades of domination, the Aztecs would finally make their move and wage war against their ruthless overlords. And they would launch a series of wildly ambitious building projects around their growing island city that would earn them a reputation as the greatest engineers of the Americas. The founding tribe of the Aztecs called themselves the Mexica. The country of Mexico gets its name from this tribe. It is 1428, and the Aztecs have declared war on their overlords, a tribe called the Tepanex. But to defeat the Tepanex, they would need a little help from their neighbors. The Aztecs approached the nearby city-state of Texcoco. There, a decisive leader was on the rise. His name was Coyotl and his domineering leadership would be instrumental in forging the Aztec Empire. With Coyotl at their side, the Aztec underdogs would go for the jugular. They launched an all-out attack on the Tepanek capital. After a siege of more than 100 days, they broke through Tepanek defenses and slaughtered their oppressors. After capturing the Tepanek king, Maxtla, King Netzwalcoyotl personally cut out his heart and sprinkled his blood into the waters of Lake Texcoco. Suddenly, the tables had turned. That is the exact moment of the beginning of the empire, and the Aztecs became the leaders of the Valley of Mexico. After conquering the Valley of Mexico, the Aztecs could now turn their attention to bringing clean water to their growing city. Remarkably, the Aztecs would independently design and build something that only a few world empires would master, the aqueduct. The aqueduct actually had two channels, each about five feet high and three feet wide. One would be cleaned and maintained, while the other was being used so the water flow was never interrupted. The twin tube aqueduct ran for three miles from the mainland to the center of the island city. In town, water streamed into public fountains and reservoirs and was distributed to the public in large clay jars or by canoe. In comparison to the Europeans, the Aztec were a very clean people. We know that the Aztec emperor bathed twice a day, so in terms of hygiene, the Aztec people uh, was much more advanced than the Europeans. While the Aztec nobles were bathing in luxury, at this time in Europe, plague caused by unsanitary conditions was killing millions. King Netzwalcoyotl's own bath was one of the most unique in the Americas. It was fed by a sophisticated aqueduct system that also brought running water to his palace grounds. Behind me is the hill of Tezcozinco. And on this hill, Nezahualcoyotl built a fantastic pleasure palace. And around this palace, a virtual botanical garden filled with all of the exotic flowers of Mesoamerica. Nezahualcoyotl brought water from the Sierra Nevada mountains all the way down to here, into this hill, to his palace, just to water his plants. To install an aqueduct there, Nezahualcoyotl had to fill a huge gorge between Tezcozinco and the next hill. As the water arrived at the first hill, it gathered in small pools built to control the speed of the flow before it reached the aqueduct. After crossing the aqueduct, the water ran in a circuit around Tezcozinco Hill, spilling off over the sides in rock-cut waterfalls to water the gardens. It ended up in a nearly perfectly round rock-cut pool called the King's Bath. And from here, he could look upon his domain at Texcoco, and he could look down at the botanical gardens that he was watering with his fantastic aqueducts. It is indeed a bath fit for a king. 
By the mid-15th century, with their empire on the rise, it was time for the Aztecs to choose a sovereign leader. He was called Moctezuma, and he would be the first of two emperors with this now famous name. Moctezuma's first order of business was to extend the empire's borders. The Aztecs captured city-states southward to the valley of Oaxaca, westward to the Pacific, and east toward the Gulf of Mexico. By 1449, the empire contained as many as 15 million people. In the short span of 100 years, the Aztecs accomplished the impossible. They had toppled the Mesoamerican world order. But while the Aztecs dominated militarily, their island city was vulnerable to a different kind of enemy. Like New Orleans, Tenochtitlan was constantly doing battle with water. And one of Moctezuma's first projects was to protect his city from the deluge of water surrounding it. This is what is left of Lake Xochimilco, the southern part of Mexico City in Aztec times, the city of Tenochtitlan. This lake, like the other four lakes that surrounded the city, were spring-fed. Thus, there were no rivers or streams into which it could drain. And if it rained hard enough, the water would rise up and sweep over the land and into the city itself. And this is exactly what happened in the mid-1400s when a flood of catastrophic proportions swept into Tenochtitlan. The city and the empire it commanded were almost completely destroyed, and the Aztec civilization had to once again rely upon the genius of its engineers, and one engineer in particular. Moctezuma enlisted the help of his old ally, Nezahualcoyotl, to protect the city he was rebuilding from the lake. Nezahualcoyotl would design a solution that would make him the greatest engineer on the continent. His plan was to create a safe zone around the city with a huge dike that would protect Tenochtitlan and its inhabitants. It was designed to be larger than any earthwork anywhere in the Americas at the time, running for 10 miles just east of the city from the southern edge of the lake across to the north. The walls were a wickerwork construction made of sticks, reeds, stone, and earth. Since the lake was shallow, the dike was only about 12 feet in height, but some 27 feet wide. Nezahualcoyotl fitted the dike with sluice gates, most likely wooden doors that would be raised or lowered to control the water level behind it. The dike also served another purpose. It protected their water supply. It was important to build some sort of protective mechanism to keep salt water out of the freshwater western part of the lake. An army marches on its stomach, so said Napoleon. Now an ample food supply for civilians is a no-brainer in the critical development of any civilization. But the Aztecs perfected a unique method, not only to provide a substantial food supply for its civilian populace, but to fuel the military expansion of its empire. This revolutionary engineering was called chinampas, a system that allowed them to literally create new land to farm and to live on. If you're going to have a city of any size, you have to provide room for them. And so what they did was build up these chinampas in the lake bed. Basically, a chinampa is an artificial island built in the lake. They look like narrow football fields, about 300 feet long by about 30 feet wide. A chinampa was built by weaving a web of sticks floating in the water and piling reeds on top of them. Mud was then scraped from the lake bottom and piled atop the reeds to form the chinampa. It took four to six men eight days to build the average chinampa. They were connected to the city by massive navigational canals that would take thousands of men months to build. A chinampa like this one could produce up to seven crops a year, whereas a farm on the mainland could yield one, maybe two, maybe three at the most. 
As a crop was ready to harvest on a chinampa, seedlings from another would be sprouting out of mud that would be spread on a boat adjacent to the chinampa. Then when the seedlings were ready, they'd be transported to the chinampa, and this cycle would be repeated over and over and over again on hundreds and then thousands of chinampas. Now, it was this technology that transformed Tenochtitlan from just another tribal town in the 14th century to a dominant and thriving city-state. With their city's infrastructure in place and vast lands under their control, the Aztecs would push the boundaries of their empire further than ever before. They'd create a far-flung network of roads, Aztec superhighways. But as the empire grew, so too did their practice of human sacrifice. Soon, rivers of blood would be flowing through the streets of Tenochtitlan. The average life expectancy of an Aztec citizen was 37 years. Today, Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire, is gone, buried under modern-day Mexico City. But 700 years ago, it was a shining capital on the rise, built by advanced engineers and led by larger-than-life emperors. By the late 15th century, the Aztec population had exploded. Their next great emperor would launch a series of conquests that would rival anything in world history. His name was Ahuitzotl, and he would prove to be an even greater warrior than his grandfather, Moctezuma. By 1502, Ahuitzotl had conquered territory from Mexico's Pacific coast and pushed the empire as far south as Guatemala. His reign was kind of like a golden age. He was a king that opened up transport routes to the coastal areas and to lowland areas where the Aztecs got their greatest luxuries, these shimmering tropical feathers, the gold, the precious stones that the, the nobles and rulers wore as symbols of their station in life. To transport riches to the heart of the empire, the Aztecs constructed a network of superhighways throughout central Mexico. Relay runners were stationed every few miles to create a sort of ancient Federal Express. Messages or goods could be sent 200 miles from the Gulf Coast to Tenochtitlan in just 24 hours, faster than the Postal Service today. With the empire at its height, the Aztecs under Ahuitzotl embarked on their greatest construction project, a massive pyramid at the very center of Tenochtitlan, the symbol of their absolute power. It was called the Templo Mayor, or Great Temple. The base of the pyramid was 240 feet deep by 300 feet wide and rose to a height of 15 stories. There were at least 117 steps in two staircases climbing 200 feet, leading to twin temples to honor the gods of rain and war. The temple was rebuilt on the same location seven times, beginning in 1325 with the city's founding. As the empire grew, so did the pyramid. Each stage was simply built right on top of the stage before. The Temple Mayor was built mainly uh, with a stone called Tezontli, that is uh, volcanic stone. It's a very light weight stone that would uh, prevent the sinking of the, of the temple. For floors and walls, the Aztecs applied a lime plaster, which was a form of concrete. Some examples found today remain as hard as modern concrete, even after 500 years. Aztec workers labored for decades to complete their monument to the gods. The temple remained buried until 1978, when power company workers digging a trench accidentally uncovered a huge carved stone and discovered the temple ruins next to it. The disk, 11 feet in diameter, weighs 8 tons and depicts the dismembered body of the goddess Koyoshalqui. Koyol Shautkli was the moon goddess, but her brother murdered her because she became pregnant in a very shameful way. 
Now, the Aztecs weren't prudes by any means. Matter of fact, nobles had many wives and concubines, but amongst the commoners, particularly women, adultery was a no-no and severely punished, often by death. So according to legend, the moon goddess's brother cut her head off, and after he decapitated her, he shoved her body down a hill. The Aztecs reenacted this killing literally and frequently in festivals throughout their calendar year. They would decapitate their victims at the top of a pyramid like this and then push the carcasses down the steps to the great stone at the bottom. For the Romans, their most precious treasure was gold. For the Egyptians, it was the afterlife. For the Aztecs, it was human blood. They felt a sense of reciprocity with the gods. So they needed to give a thanksgiving to the gods, giving the most precious thing they had that was human blood. The Aztecs called it precious water. And they believed that if the gods didn't receive it in massive quantities, the world would end in apocalypse. It was common practice to adorn the walls of the insides of the temples with fresh human blood. And the smell must have been appalling. To dedicate his expansion of the great temple, Emperor Awitzotl held a mass sacrifice. The heads of victims were displayed prominently on skull racks around the temple. According to some uh, chronicles, they say that there were sacrificed 20,000 people. From a practical point of view and from a scientific point of view, it sounds impossible. So I think that the chronicle that is written by Spanish... ...sources is basically telling us that to their eyes, they were many. As Awid Zodal's reign continued, the bloodletting skyrocketed. Life in Tenochtitlan soon became an orgy of death. Friends and enemies alike would be brought in to witness the, the sacrifices. It's always ritual sacrifice, it's always a ritual event, but it was also a political statement. And it was a, kind, a form of intimidation. By the time of Awitzotl's death, the Aztecs had institutionalized sacrificial killing and turned killing on the battlefield into an art form. They were the America's fiercest fighters, an elite cadre of whom would have a spectacular new mountainside temple dedicated to them. But even they were not prepared for the war of the worlds that was about to descend upon them. Aztecs used obsidian to craft their blades, a volcanic stone so sharp it's utilized in modern day eye surgery. 1502. Awitzotl, Emperor of the Aztecs, is dead. Moctezuma II, a 34-year-old former priest, comes to power. A world away in Spain, an 18-year-old notary named Hernán Cortés is preparing to cross the Atlantic to join in his country's conquest of the New World. This is the zenith of the Aztec Empire. It now covers at least 80,000 square miles, reaching out from Tenochtitlan to both coasts and as far south as Guatemala. Some 25 million people are subject to Aztec rule. 38 provinces containing innumerable city-states are paying them heavy tribute, making the emperor and nobles fabulously rich. The city spread out glittering against its canals and its lake, bedecked with fine trees and beautiful mansions. And Moctezuma II presided over it all. He was known for his statesmanship and military skills. A tough leader, he slaughtered the population of towns that wouldn't bend to his rule. But privately, he was troubled. It seems that Moctezuma was a passive individual, perhaps even a depressive individual. Legend says that when he witnessed a comet streaking across the skies over Tenochtitlan, he spent the rest of the night in tears. 
as the weeks went by, he became increasingly paranoid. But at the height of his obsession with the supernatural, a very real threat approached from across the sea. Spies posted along the Gulf Coast reported strange sightings offshore that they were at a loss to describe. They never have seen a boat, so they didn't even have a word to, 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 to describe that. So the Indians refer to those boats as mountains that move in the water. In 1519, after sailing from Cuba, Cortez landed with 11 of these floating mountains and 500 men on the Gulf of Mexico, 200 miles southeast of Tenochtitlan. The tribes were astonished by these men with metal armor and animals they had never seen. As he moved inland, tribes who resisted were brutally slaughtered, but many others were happy to provide him with provisions and men. One of the ways in which one local lord down on the Gulf Coast curried favor was to give Cortez and his company a group of women who were to not only provide for them in housekeepers sort of manner, but were also clearly meant to be courtesans as well and provide sexual services to them. But among the concubines, one in particular caught the eye of Cortez himself. She was the daughter of a chieftain who had been sold into slavery and was called La Malinche. They developed an intimate relationship, and in time, she bore a son to him. And he would have been one of the first people of mixed blood in the New World. But she was much more than a mistress. She became an interpreter for Cortez, and her role expanded to advisor and intermediary between him and the Aztecs. Not only was she his translator, but she could also tell him about things that were being said that he was not intended to hear or understand. Moctezuma's network of relay runners kept him apprised of the Spaniards' movements. It was clear they were headed for his city. As he advanced toward Tenochtitlan through the summer of 1519, Cortez amassed an army of thousands. Moctezuma's army of warriors numbered in the hundreds of thousands. They wore animal costumes on the battlefield to intimidate their opponents. Part of it was spectacle. You had just incredible costumes that the different warriors would wear. The most important warriors were knights, dressed as jaguars and eagles. The Aztec Knights were initiated into their orders at sacred ceremonies at special temples like this one. This is the cave temple at Malinalco, one of six temples on this remote mountainside a few hours south of Mexico City. It was finished by Moctezuma II around 1502, shortly after his coronation. Now, over in Europe, Michelangelo was pounding out the David for the Republic of Florence. But while Michelangelo was carving the David, the Aztecs were here carving this temple right out of the side of this mountain. And it is the only temple in the entire Western Hemisphere built in this manner. At the bottom of the stairs of Kualcali are the sculptures of two jaguars. On each side of the door, there are the remnants of two warriors. Now, the door itself represents the open mouth of a giant serpent. You can literally see its tongue coming out of the room. The Aztecs believed that this was the entrance to the womb of the earth. Now, the privileged warriors would come here, go into the room with sculptures of eagles, have their noses pierced, and offer blood and sacrifice to Huitzilopochtli, the god of war. But this would be by no means the last time these Aztec warriors would spill their blood. The first meeting between Cortez and Moctezuma would be peaceful, but the conquistador knew a huge and bloody clash between the old world and the new would soon take place. And the annihilation that ensued would become one of the most frightening events in the history of the Americas. Cocoa beans were so valuable a commodity to the Aztecs, they were even used as a currency. 
It is the fall of 1519. Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés has finally reached the gleaming Aztec capital he has heard so much about, Tenochtitlan. When the Spaniards first saw Tenochtitlan, they thought they were in some kind of an enchanted vision. They thought they'd entered some kind of a dream. A massive force of native warriors allied against the Aztecs accompanies him as he advances on the main causeway into the city. The meeting of Cortes and Montezuma on a causeway approaching Tenochtitlan had to be one of the most remarkable events in world history. It's really a, a, a meeting of two different worlds. And Cortes offered his hand, but the minute he started to do that, to actually touch Montezuma, the noble attendants around Montezuma pushed Cortes away and said, no, 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 that's, that's a total indignity. Nobody touches Montezuma, the great lord of the land. The meeting of the two worlds was peaceful, but fraught with tension. Moctezuma by this time had become increasingly impulsive and prone to bouts of hysteria. So the encounter was a, an, an encounter of, of sensing the, the, the forces no, in each side. But the Aztecs had a diplomacy and a warfare system that was somewhat naive in comparison to the very tricky and sly system of the Europeans. Moctezuma invited the Spaniards to stay in one of his palaces. It would prove to be a catastrophic mistake. As the Spaniards entered the city, they were so awed they thought they were dreaming. At the heart of the city stood the emperor's colossal palace. The palace of Moctezuma II was a massive complex spread across six acres near the great temple. One of the Spaniards noted that every day at Moctezuma's palace, 600 nobles gathered, and they would hear the word of their emperor. Moctezuma received the Spaniards in a large reception chamber just beyond the main entrance, designed to make the emperor appear omnipotent. But Moctezuma's palace would be the last ever built by the Aztecs. Not a week into their visit, the Spaniards went for the jugular, kidnapping Moctezuma. It was an audacious move, but it paid off. The empire appeared to be theirs. Even though Moctezuma was still the official leader of the city, it was, he was really, for some time, nothing more than a mouthpiece for Cortes. For six months, tensions within the walls of Tenochtitlan slowly simmered. Then, in the spring of 1520, it all came to a head. One morning, Spanish soldiers interrupted a sacred sacrifice and slaughtered those taking part. The move sparked an uprising. For the Aztecs, the Spaniards had committed an unspeakable sacrilege. The city became engulfed in chaos as the Aztecs marched on Moctezuma's palace. Moctezuma gets up on the top of the palace and tries to talk to the people and calm them down, and by now they're just not having any of it. Moctezuma had become nothing more than the Spaniard's puppet, a betrayal so great in the eyes of his people, they pummeled him with rocks and arrows. Shortly after, Moctezuma's lifeless body was tossed from the palace walls. Whether he died at Spanish hands or from injuries inflicted by his own people may never be known. And the Spaniards at that point decide this would be a, probably a good time to leave the city. On the night of June 30th, 1520, the Spaniards attempted to escape under cover of darkness. But they can't separate themselves from the plunder that they've gotten so far, so they're weighted down with all of the things that they want to take with them. They were easy targets for the Aztec warriors who caught them on the causeway. Bodies quickly piled up in the water. 400 Spaniards were killed along with several thousand of their Indian allies. That escape has, has come to be called the Noche Triste, the sad night. Cortez and a few others managed to escape with their lives. 
the Spaniards would now destroy the shining city of Tenochtitlan for good. He would begin by severing the lifeblood of the city, the aqueduct. As hundreds of thousands of people within the city's walls were without water, Cortez created a blockade around Tenochtitlan to cut off all outside supplies of food. So the idea of this uh, blockade was to try to, sur to make surrender the city by hunger. And the Aztecs had a tremendous resistance, so they couldn't be defeated easily. And what they decided to do is to mount a, an attack both by land and by sea. For centuries, the lake around Tenochtitlan was a barrier against invaders. But Cortez would find a way around that. He had thousands of his Indian allies carry ships in pieces up thousands of feet over the mountains to be assembled and launched into the lake. May 1521. Cortez unleashes his massive army in a final decisive attack on Tenochtitlan. 600 Spaniards, including 100 cavalrymen and upwards of 50,000 of their Indian allies clash with the Aztec defenders of the city on its grand causeways. Brutal fighting continued for months. Day by day, Cortez raised the city block by block. He and his Indian allies were merciless in their systematic slaughter of the population. It was an extremely hard fought battle, especially in the city precincts. The Aztecs made a last stand at the great temple in Tlatelolco. Warriors lined the steep steps to rain down arrows and rocks on their enemy. But it was hopeless. On August 13th, the final Aztec leader, Cuauhtémoc, was captured and surrendered to Cortez. And that was just the beginning. 20 million would die of disease brought by the Spaniards. By the end of the 16th century, we estimate that the native population had been reduced by about 90 percent. Modern-day Mexico City has been built atop the rubble of the once majestic city of Tenochtitlan. The Spaniards leveled it during the construction of their own colonial capital, even using stones from the great temple to build their cathedral still standing next to the temple ruins. This week, join me as I explore a lost civilization bathed in blood. By the early 16th century, the Aztec Empire was the largest ever to rule Mesoamerica. When the Spanish conquistadors arrived in Mexico, they recorded that the Aztecs were conducting human sacrifice on an unprecedented scale. In one instance, over 80,000 victims in just four days. It's a very sacred site. Just who were the Aztecs, and why did they conduct ritual human sacrifice? They reach in, grab my still beating heart, and pull it up and show it to the world. Were the Spanish accounts grossly exaggerated, or were they true? To find out, I'll experiment with the weapons of a warrior nation. Use forensic science to examine scarred bones from an Aztec burial site, and put some of the legends of blood sacrifice to the test. We're digging for the truth, and we're going to extremes to do it. That's the bone. This is Socolo Square. Today, it's the heart of Mexico City, and I'm told, the largest square in Latin America. 500 years ago, this was the center of the Aztec Empire, a civilization synonymous with human sacrifice. Hi, I'm Josh Bernstein. I've come back to Mexico to explore whether or not the horrific stories of a culture soaked in blood could possibly be true. The Aztecs became associated with human sacrifice thanks to these vividly illustrated Spanish chronicles. Created in the 16th century AD, during the Spanish conquest of Mexico, they record a culture that celebrated extreme ritual violence. A society where Aztec priests tore out the hearts of sacrificial victims and painted their temples with their blood. But are these accurate descriptions of real events? 
were merely the propaganda of a conquering power. To find out, I'm meeting up with Dr. David Carrasco of Harvard University's Divinity School. He's been studying the Aztecs nearly all his life. So we're just a stone's throw from the main square. Yes, and we've arrived right at the very foot of the great Aztec temple. This is one of the greatest finds in all of the Americas. Yes, it uh, really represented for the Aztecs the center of not only the Aztec Empire, but the whole cosmos. You can compare it to something like Mecca or the Vatican today. This was the, the holy of holies in the Aztec world. That may be, but today the site appears sparse and incomplete. Today, this is all that remains? This is all that remains because what happened was when the Spaniards came, they saw this as a house of evil idols and they saw the building itself as an evil building. Then they destroyed the temple, knocking off the top 85, 90 percent. So, so really what we're seeing here is just the tip of the iceberg. It is the tip of the iceberg. David tells me 95 to 98 percent of the Aztec Empire remains undiscovered. Although much still lies beneath Mexico City, 30 years of excavations at the Templo Mayor have given archaeologists new insights into the world of the Aztecs and how they built their holy city. We can see a historical narrative in stone. What the Aztecs did was take volcanic rock, put it together with their mortar to build uh, walls that really stood the test of time. They also built walls that weren't so heavy. And the reason they wanted to not build heavy walls was because they actually built this city on a lake, a very soggy lake, in fact. Mm -hmm. Why in a lake? The answer can be found in the icons on the Mexican flag. According to Aztec legend, these icons come from ancient divine instructions. The Aztec were to migrate and resettle, building a new capital at the place where they saw an eagle perched on a cactus while eating a snake. That place turned out to be in the middle of a lake. Through crafty engineering, the Aztecs turned the swampy soil into solid, buildable land. They called their new city Tenochtitlan. It grew to become a thriving metropolis. At its height, in the middle of the 15th century AD, it was home to 250,000 people, as large as any European city of the time. When Hernán Cortés and the Spanish conquistadors first laid eyes on this floating capital, they thought they were dreaming. But as Cortés and his army entered the city, the dream became a nightmare. According to their accounts, the Aztec capital was a city where intense ritual violence was an everyday event. One thing that's fundamental David explains that the topic of human sacrifice is a sensitive subject for many Mexicans today. They question the accuracy and savagery of the Spanish accounts. Still, archaeology has uncovered some undeniable and uncomfortable truths. This is the precinct of the Eagle Warriors. We enter a section of the Templo Mayor to see where Aztec warriors ritually prepared for battle. In the, in the Aztec world, there were two groups of military heroes. One were the Jaguar warriors, but the most powerful were the Eagle warriors. And the excavation of the Great Temple led to the discovery of this place, which was where Eagle warriors were initiated. David tells me that archaeologists recently conducted a chemical analysis of the floor in the precinct of the Eagle Warriors. What they found in this section of the temple was astonishing. They found evidence of blood. They found blood here in the ground. That is, blood offerings were given here, probably by the warriors undergoing initiation. Their own blood. Their own blood. David says that sacrifice was tightly woven into the fabric of Aztec life. People engaged in bloodletting, also known as auto-sacrifice. In this very room, warriors, using obsidian blades and cactus needles, would draw blood from their arms, fingers, and thighs as offerings to the gods. But David explains that this was only a small percentage of the blood offerings being made. Most of the bloodshed at the Templo Mayor came from the Aztecs' enemies. The reason for the slaughter, he says, was in part religious, and it was in equal parts a chilling display of power politics. Once a year, sac a very powerful sacrifice was carried out right here at the Templo Mayor. Mm -hmm. And what happened is, 
enemy warriors were brought in from other communities and they were sacrificed in a ceremony called the Feast of the Flaying of Men. Nice, like the Feast of the Flaying of Men? Yes, yeah, right. They were carried up the steps mm -hmm. and hidden up above, behind bowers, were the actual rulers of their own community. So they bring the, the heads of their competition, their enemies, here to witness this ceremony. Yes, in this case, the sacrifice itself was a political statement. This is what happens if you defy us, if you don't pay us tribute, yeah. if you don't go along with our alliance. You come in and you watch this, right. or else we'll get you. It sounds like there was a lot of complexity. It would seem that warfare, bloodshed, and politics were part of everyday Aztec life. This is what gives us the David tells me that one artifact in particular is a testament to how central blood offerings were to their religious beliefs. For a closer look, David and I head across is, town to the National Museum of Anthropology. Is. What we're entering into is the, the greatest image of the Aztec notion of the universe. It's one of the masterpieces of world sculpture. The Aztec sunstone was discovered in 1790 in Socolo Square near the Templo Mayor. This magnificently carved stone measures 12 feet in diameter and weighs over 24 tons. While it's often referred to as a calendar stone, David tells me this is a common misconception. So when archaeologists discovered this, they thought that this spoke to the sophistication of Aztec astronomy. In part, that's what they thought, and um, it, was, uh, it was a mystery for many years, but as archaeologists and astronomers mm. began to look at it, they realized that it wasn't an astronomical chart, it was really a stone of myth. This is myth carved into stone. So can you explain to me then the story that's captured here? Well, this is called the Myths of the Suns, and it tells us that the universe has passed through four previous ages prior to the Aztec Age, and each of those ages is in one of the boxes, where we see now the Aztec Age, the age of movement or earthquake, and there is the sun god with a tongue of an obsidian knife representing that sacrifices must be given to give him energy to move across the heavens. David says the cultural significance of the obsidian tongue can't be underestimated. This blade is similar to the one the Aztec priests used to cut open the chests of sacrificial victims and carve out their hearts. The symbolism captured in the sunstone tells us the Aztecs believed their gods demanded human flesh for the sun to rise each day. They had to continue to nourish the sun. They had to continue to pay back this debt mm -hmm. of life that had been given to them. David tells me that in addition to the Spanish chronicles or codices, we also have some created by the Aztecs themselves. Interestingly, they're much less gruesome than the Spanish accounts, but they too leave little doubt that sacrifice was part of the fabric of Aztec life. Most people don't realize that 15 painted books produced prior to the coming of the Spaniards have survived the conquest. And we can look into these pictorial manuscripts and we can see images of sacrifice, gods sacrificing themselves, human beings being sacrificed, animals being sacrificed. So we have the story represented both by the insiders, the Aztecs, and the outsiders as the Spanish wrote it down. Exactly. What we have to do today is to put these two together to see what's the most accurate picture of ritual violence in the Aztec world. I'm in Mexico City investigating accounts of mass sacrifice in the Aztec world. So far, I've learned how they built the most powerful empire in Mesoamerica and a thriving capital in the middle of a lake. But there was also a dark side. The Aztecs believed their gods required a steady diet of human flesh and blood. And Spanish records describe a culture that celebrated ritual violence on an almost unimaginable scale. In particular, several accounts describe how in a single four-day period, the Aztec priests slaughtered 80,400 people. But did it really happen? To find out, I'm traveling to another Aztec temple about eight miles northwest of the Templo Mayor. We're at the archaeological zone of Santa Cecilia Acatitlan. Dr. David Carrasco of Harvard University's Divinity School has studied the religious beliefs of the Aztecs for over 30 years. The Aztecs worshipped over a hundred gods, many requiring some type of blood offering. And it was at pyramid temples like this that the gods received their bloody sacrament. David, I understand that, let's say, Egyptian pyramids were built as tombs for the pharaohs, and then Maya pyramids were built to create caves to get into the underworld. 
What about Aztec pyramids? This is one of the most sacred places in the Aztec world conceptually because it's a house of the gods. Okay. We may call it a pyramid, but for these people, this is where the gods lived. The idea is that it holds great agricultural abundance under the control of the deities and the ancestors who live inside. They guard the seeds and the hearts that give life to the world outside of the hill. For the gods to release this energy and allow life and prosperity on earth, blood offerings had to be made to the gods of the temple. Do we have any eyewitness accounts of the ceremonies that took place here? There are a few eyewitness accounts uh, that the Spaniards have left us because the Spaniards happened to see some of their own soldiers being sacrificed at a temple like this one, the, the great temple in Mexico City. Okay, well if we go up there, can you show me how the ritual played out? Yeah, let's take a, let's take a climb. Okay. As we climb the pyramid, David explains that before sacrifice, each victim or sacrificial vessel had to be properly prepared. During a 20-day celebration, his diet and his appearance were modified in preparation for the ritual ahead. At the end, he was given mind-altering substances. And let's say I'm the vessel, right? Altered state, prepared. I come up here, what happens? Well, you'd immediately come under the control of, uh, of six priests. And these six priests would then take you and they would spread you backward over against this, over the stone. Physically forcing me into position. That's right. Okay, well, let's pretend there are six invisible priests now. Which, I can tell you right away, I can feel everything in here just got a lot tighter. It's not uncomfortable, but, you know, given what's about to happen, it's probably not the best scenario. At that point, you make an incision and take out your heart. Like in the movies, they reach in, grab my still beating heart, and pull it up and show it to the world? Uh, and they would then take the heart, and they would offer it to the four quarters of the universe. And then they would take the heart, and they would place it in a special vessel. Ah. Wow, okay, beyond the, the removal of my heart, what would then happen to my now heartless body? Uh, it could be that your head would be taken off mm -hmm. and become part of the skull rack. Uh, they could also skin you because your skin was understood to be representative of the new corn. Okay. Um, and um, uh, other par body parts could also be um, distributed or used in different ritual ways. And this was something that culturally had been going on for hundreds of years. Right? Some form of this had been going on for hundreds of years. The Aztecs seemed to have escalated it as their empire got larger. Mm -hmm their temple got larger and the number of sacrifices got larger. Because yeah, their gods got stronger, I suppose. They took it to a new level and that level is the one that fascinates us today. So far, the accounts of the Spanish conquistadors appear to be holding up. But did the Aztecs really sacrifice tens of thousands of people in a single day? If so, how did they capture and then control so many people? Let's go find out. The Spanish chronicles paint a frightening portrait of the ancient Aztecs. At face value, they offer powerful evidence that large armies and fearsome warriors thrived under Aztec control. But how much of this is self-serving Spanish propaganda? And if the Aztecs did possess large armies, did they also possess the war machinery needed to capture tens of thousands of captives at a time? I decide to take a look at the weapons and tactics of the Aztecs. I'm going 1,100 miles north of Mexico City to the small town of Sonoida to meet my old friend Bob Perkins. His nearly 30-year study of ancient weaponry has earned him the unique nickname Atlatl Bob. Hi, Bob. Hey, Josh. How are you? Hey, how the hell are you? Good to see you again. Uh, yeah, so it's been a while. Well, you brought some great stuff here, huh? Yeah, brought some atlatls and darts. Okay. For us to play with out here. This was their preferred weapon for warfare. Your fingers would go in the finger loops here. Bob tells me that one of the principal weapons of the Aztecs was the atlatl. And the evidence comes not from the Spanish sources, but from the Aztecs themselves. Their gods are often depicted holding this weapon with its long arrow-like projectiles called atlatl darts. And they do look like Super arrows. Right. It it's okay. literally an arrow on steroids. Yeah. And it looked more like this. Back right. In the day. Right. Here we got a, a nice authentic example. This is made out of river cane, mm -hmm. which is indigenous to North America. In terms of throwing it, you just you'd bring your arm back. Right. And launch the dart. Launch it much like a tennis serve. Well then how about we put all this together and see 
how the LL actually works. We always want to be careful. These are deadly weapons. Give you a little demonstration of how far these things can go. You can do 100 yards with this easy. Okay. And it does like between 120 and 140 feet per second, like 80 miles an hour. Clearly, these long distance projectiles would be a concern for those on the receiving end. Go, where do I want to let go? Sir? Now it's my so turn to throw like the at level. And once, right. once you push, the momentum holds it in place. Right. Not to lateral away. Mine went more up than out. My first attempts to throw this lethal dart are, well, pathetic. And I assume that like any weapon, with time, the hunter or warrior would gain expertise in distance and control. Right. Then you've got a nice, a nice target. Bob tells me that while we'll probably never know the precise military strategies of the Aztecs, one thing is certain. They sought to maximize the number of survivors on the battlefield. Their goal? To capture their enemies alive for future sacrifices to their gods. Bob explains that the atlatl was likely used to disperse and scatter the enemy warriors. The Aztecs would then swoop in for hand-to-hand -hand combat. But when fighting in close quarters, the Aztecs had a very different weapon of choice. It was called the Macaweedle. So what we have here is Macaweedle 101. Right. This was their standard infantry weapon. What it is, basically sort of a, a canoe paddle shaped piece of wood with grooves on either edge here, okay. where they uh, fixed these obsidian blades in there along the edge with pine pitch. You got it. All right, so let's we'll make a mac weedle. First thing we do is heat up the pine pitch. Okay. okay. get completely liquid. So pine pitch, okay. beeswax, and charcoal. Right. Heat that up until it gets to be a, like a liquid goo, and then that becomes a Aztec epoxy. Right. Primitive epoxy. Hold it steady. The combination of strong wood, black pitch, and razor-sharp blades makes the Macaweedle an intimidating weapon of war. That's looking pretty vicious there, Josh. But was the Macaweedle so intimidating that the Aztecs' enemies preferred to surrender than to fight? Like, watch out! Uh, we got us. The weapon of the foot soldier for the Aztec army. This is standard issue. Arrgh! Yeah. Here you go, grasshopper. Today, uh, you are a man. Ah, uh, thank you. <laughs> I have my wheel. Bob's hung up a few watermelons so we can test the weapon's sharpness. Very good. I like the Macweed. Bob like. Yes. Deadly weapon. So we've proven that this is sharper than a melon. But I'm aware that we're not just going to stop at melons. No. We we got the beef. We got beef. Try this thing on flesh and bone. Flesh and bone. Look at that. Yeah. Nice big side of beef there. Okay. Bones. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, I think, Bob. Good? You got the Mac Weedle. You're in charge. Okay. Here we go. Work. Yeah. Switching sides. No wonder some of the Aztecs' opponents chose surrender over war. In there. Yeah, I can hear. That's the bone. Effective, you think? Oh, highly effective. Slightly. So the Atlatl and the Macweedle, very effective weapons of war. But what about in terms of the quantities that people needed to create these giant sacrifices? The whole thing with their warfare was to come in and they would hook and jab for real, but it was all out maneuvering one side or another, and once the, once the other side knew that resistance was futile, they would start to give it up. Bob tells me that minimizing casualties on the battlefield was preferred. In fact, warriors were given special incentives to bring back live bodies, saving them for the bloody altars that fed their gods. The more captives they brought back for the sacrificial altar, the higher up in rank they went. They could actually go from a commoner to, to nobility based on their skill and prowess and warfare. So do we know how often the Aztec were at war? The Aztecs were in a constant state of warfare. This was a full tilt boogie warrior society. 
Bob says the Aztecs even waged war for the sole purpose of bringing back sacrificial victims. They called these campaigns the Flower Wars. Because they were constantly at war, they always had access to more sacrificial victims. Yes. This is their life. This is the way they were. This was their culture. So it is possible, then, that there's some validity to this number. I'm in Mexico investigating the Spanish accounts of Aztec human sacrifice. Lying on a temple altar, I've learned how victims were killed and their hearts offered up to the Aztec gods. What, reach in and rip out my still beating heart. I've also wielded the weapons of the Aztec warrior. We got the beef. We got beef. And found out why surrender followed by sacrifice might have been preferable to fighting to the end. But could the Aztecs, as the Spanish accounts contend, actually gather 80,400 captives into their capital, Tenochtitlan, for a massive four-day blood sacrifice? And how could a single city control so many prisoners, especially when it was planning to kill them? The answers, again, may lie in the images left by the Aztecs themselves. They frequently show a foaming white cup in the hands of an Aztec priest. It contains an intoxicating beverage used to subdue human victims before sacrifice. It's given one American scholar a lot of food for thought. His name is Dr. Robert Bai. He's an American ethnobotanist who's researched the plant life of Mexico for over 30 years. We're driving together to a hillside above the town of Toluca, about an hour and a half west of Mexico City. Bob tells me that the white foam drink depicted in the Aztec codices is called pulque. And pulque is still made in Mexico today. Produced only in rural areas, it's created by the rapid fermentation of the sugary sap from the maguey plant. That'd be good. Well, I don't want. Almost a... Quiero presentar a Josh. Mucho gusto. The scientific name is agave, mm -hmm. uh, and the maguey plant is the common name. There are about 140 species in Mexico, and there are about 8 or 10 that are specifically used for the uh, production of pulque. So the same plant that makes tequila in certain parts of Mexico makes... Right, this is species specifically for making uh, pulque. The sweet-tasting liquid of the maguey is called aguamiel, or honey water. To gather the precious fluid, a few of the plant's broad leaves have been cut down to the base. The plant's central stalk has also been removed, and the agua miel collects in the hollow that remains. And then every day, about four liters of agua miel uh, exudes into the center. He comes along and takes out the liquid. So can I see how it's done? Yes. Juan, can you start to take the agua miel, por favor? Yes. Yes, can you I don't know if you can see this, but the bottle is filling up with liquid. Depending on size, one plant can be harvested daily for up to four months. So this is the aguamiel in here now. Right. And now that he's suctioned that off, he's going yeah. to now put it, into, put it in there. into his... That's pretty quick. Next phase, turning fresh aguamiel into a frothing brew of pulque. I'll let him lead the way. For that, we head to Don Juan's home to see how it's done. This is where pulque happens. This is where it's fermented. Okay. So when he comes back from the field, what he has is his agua miel, the honey water. Mm -hmm. And what he needs to do is put it into the batch that he has already fermented from previous days. And then once he has the harvest basically emptied into this barrel, how long does it have to ferment? The people here usually like the weaker pulque, so they'll leave it for about a day. Okay. Uh, uh, other pulques uh, can ferment up to about seven days, about a week. Right, but right now it's called agua miel. It's agua miel. Uh, and then after, after a day, it becomes after pulque. It, it becomes pulque. Okay, let's try it. Okay, so here we can see right. the pulque foam on top. Yes. Yeah, it's definitely yeasty. I can taste the fermentation happening. I don't know what it tastes like, though, in terms of like comparable drinks. You know? Well, uh, it might taste like a, a lightly malted beer. Very light. It could become stronger uh, either by letting it ferment longer, up to about seven days when it reaches its peak. It'll get up uh, to about four to five percent. So a few glasses of modern pulque might take the edge off a long day, but it wouldn't put you in the mood to be sacrificed. But according to Bob, Aztec pulque was a little more extreme. 
So pulque was part of the ritual process. Its role was primarily to create altered states of mind. And that's correct. On one hand, we have the alcohol, which would uh, inhibit the central nervous system, mm -hmm. but also uh, certain uh, divine pulques were made using different kind of herbs that would help uh, further enhance the altered state of mind. Ah, so even the, what we're drinking is just one form of pulque. Right. This is the, the pure form okay. that uh, is unaltered. Salud. <laughs> yeah, salud. Bob explains Aztec priests spiked pulque with herbs to heighten the hallucinogenic effect on their sacrificial victims before reaching the altar. To learn more about these herbs, we return to Mexico City to a very special herbal market. It's here where one can still find the hallucinogenic plants once used by the Aztec priests. We have a nice selection of herbs here. Yeah, we have uh, herbs that come from all around the country mm -hmm. and also uh, other parts of Mesoamerica. Uh -huh. Okay, there's probably about uh, 60 or 70 species of plants that were used in making different concoctions that were given to the participants in, in human sacrifices. In terms of really stunning the people, uh, especially the sacrificial victims, so that they uh, would be more submissive. I and mean, here we have a plant. This is very dangerous. This is called tolawachi. that are used to numb the nervous system. Can and, I, that no, no, I, I wouldn't touch it because it's very, very dangerous. And, and this really? is something that uh, people become crazy. In fact, in Mexico, just, just touching is, it, just touching it, and then uh, You're touching I, it. Uh, I've been touching this for about 35 years, so people uh, think I'm already crazy. Oh, I see. So th this is okay. a tolawachi is also called datura. Hold on, I want to. If I use these, and requires very careful handling. Wow, I didn't think you could go crazy from just touching a, right. a plant. I always wonder when I hear about plants like this, how they discovered that effect. Like someone must have one day accidentally eaten this right. and went off on a little trip and came back and said, guys, check this out. Check this out, exactly. Yeah? So, so if someone wanted to put another person in an altered state of mind, this plant would do that. This would be one of the best plants to do that, correct. Okay, I'll put it down before I go crazy. Right. <laughs> Bob has analyzed the Aztec codices carefully. He believes their priests were familiar with the psychoactive and medicinal properties of many plants. In fact, he says their knowledge was encyclopedic. And one of the other codices, they record over 3,500 medicinal plants. And today we still haven't discovered uh, even what a third of those plants are. Gotcha. That's amazing. Yep. It's highly suggestive. The Aztecs possessed the means to chemically and psychologically incapacitate large numbers of prisoners prior to their slaughter. But was it on the scale the Spanish alleged? I'm in Mexico trying to separate fact from fiction in the bloody world of the ancient Aztecs. I'm investigating 15th century Spanish allegations of a mass sacrifice of human captives an astounding 80,400 victims in just four days. I've tested the Macaweedle, their ferocious sword. And I've sampled pulque, the potion they use to incapacitate their prisoners. Now it's time to review the forensic evidence. I'm headed to Tlatelolco, what used to be the second largest temple in the Aztec capital region. Today, it lies in ruin, flanked by apartment buildings. Like the Templo Mayor, very little can be seen. It was destroyed by the Spanish and only rediscovered during a modern construction project. I'm meeting Dr. Carmen Pijuan from the National Museum of Anthropology. How are you? Good, nice to see you. Thank you. Another great place. She studied yeah. the burials here in great detail for over 20 years. First excavations here at Tlatelolco were in 1953, they started excavating and they found part of the Templo Mayor. This is the Templo Mayor of Tlatelolco. But they found bones here too? Yeah, oh, quite a lot of them. Carmen tells me that thousands of bones were found here at Tlatelolco. Huge piles were found next to an important temple structure. The quantity and location indicated that the burials here were unusual. Two skeletons, nicknamed the Tlatelolco Lovers, are still on site today. That's an interesting exhibit. This is where these bodies were actually found. Yes, they were found here, and it's a woman on the left, a man on the right. Mm -hmm. The woman is fairly young, 18 to 20 years old. But were they sacrificial victims? The evidence to date remains circumstantial. 
However, the sacrificial offerings found at Tlatelolco are among the largest collections of human remains recovered from the Aztec Empire. To validate accounts of human sacrifice, scientists like Carmen have had to work backwards. They examined how people were handled after their hearts were removed. This is perhaps one of the most famous and gruesome images from the Spanish codices. But for archaeologists, it proved to be a vital clue. To find out why, Carmen invites me back to her lab at the National Museum of Anthropology. All these boxes have uh, skeletons from uh, different parts of Mexico. Cranios. And you can put it here. So these came from where from we just Plata were? Lolco. Yes, yeah. these skulls are from the Zompantli, which is the skull wreck. Mm. And uh, in Tlatelolco, 170 uh, skulls were found from the Sompantli. Mm -hmm. So this is what you're talking about, this hole here? Yes, and this hole was done by impacts. These skulls are among the greatest discoveries made at Tlatelolco. Archaeologists now possess proof that the Aztecs built skull racks from the craniums of their victims. Uh, they put a stick, like if it was a necklace. Mm -hmm. that the point was to put it on a rack. On a rack. Further study of the skeletal remains from Tlatelolco tells us how the rest of the body was ritually processed. You can see the cut marks here. Carmen shows me clear evidence of the flaying, skinning, and defleshing that the Spanish described. The score marks left on the bones tell the gruesome story. Um, for example, in this femur, mm -hmm. we have the cut marks over here. You see them? Oh, yeah. And, uh, and these cut marks were left when they were opening the articulation so that they could uh, dismember the person. So do you find score marks on a lot of these bones? And in this, uh, in this burial, uh, we find uh, cut marks on almost all of the bones. So do we know how they actually did the dismembering? Mm -hmm. They usually used uh, this kind of blades, an obsidian blade. And you found these with the bones, or these are just modern replicas? No, these were found with uh, some of the Sompantli skulls. So we know that there's a good chance that this type of blade was used to make yes. these score marks, right? Yeah, yes, exactly. My other curiosity is that you know, we have the Spanish chronicles. We have the references of the conquistadors. Yes. But we don't know if they're telling the truth. Here we have bones which seem to support the story of massive amounts of sacrifice. Yes. Right. So what do these bones tell us about the people who were sacrificed here? They are very young people and 75% uh, are males and 25% are female. Carmen tells me these sacrificial victims were mostly males of warrior age from areas beyond Tenochtitlan. I've already learned that warfare was the vehicle by which Aztecs captured their future victims. Here is physical evidence to support this. The end was not to kill mm -hmm. the warrior, but to captivate it, mm -hmm. to be sacrificed. And there's more. Though most of the bones appear to belong to warriors, almost none bears battle scars. It's yet more proof that the Aztecs really did possess the ability to overwhelm their captives. Physically, psychologically, chemically. It seems these people barely resisted going to the altar. This building is a repetition of our ancient myth. I'm in Mexico investigating the Spanish accounts of Aztec human sacrifice. So far, I've examined the motives behind the violence. And I've looked at the bones left over from the slaughter. The point was to put it on a rack. On a rack. <laughs> I've handled the weapons used to capture the Aztec's victims and tasted the potions that subdued them. Salud. Salud. The evidence so far is compelling. Oh. There can be no doubt the Aztecs practiced human sacrifice on an unimaginable scale. But one big question remains. The Spanish wrote of a four-day orgy of violence that left 80,400 human beings dead. Was it an exaggeration or the truth? Today, 
Mexico City covers 98% of the Aztec capital, and the victims' bodies cannot be easily located and counted. But there is another way to creatively put the story to the test. As you can see, I've come to a meat processing plant, and if you're wondering why, 80,400 people sacrificing just four days seems like a tremendous quantity. So I've come here to the largest plant in Latin America to see if that much flesh and bone can actually be processed using modern technology. To give me a hand with this unusual experiment, ah, it's a great place. You know? I'm meeting Dr. Manuel Aguilar of California State University in Los Angeles. According to the codices, we have 80,400 people in four days. Yes, they give us about 20,000 roughly per day. How does that compare to the meat processing plant? The uh, state-of-the-art facilities that we have produce about 375 cows per hour. 375 cows per hour? Per hour yes, so wow. if we extrapolate and we calculate that they would work 24 hours, so that gives us uh, about 9,000 9, cows. cows per day, yes. So a okay, meat processing plant, 9,000 cows per day, yes. for 24 hours, 24 hours. Right? if they worked around the clock, 20,100 people in the Aztecs sacrificed. Still the Aztecs are winning, yes. The Aztecs are winning in this very gruesome competition, okay. <laughs> so, okay but that's not the fairest comparison, right? Manuel explains that in order to conduct a fair comparison, we need to weigh the flesh of the cow alongside the flesh of a sacrificial victim. We need to compare pound to pound right. to okay. see a, a better proportion. Okay, so how much would a person weigh during the Aztec Empire? We can say an average of 150 pounds. Okay, so 150 pounds times 20,000. 100 people. We're talking about 3 million pounds three million, three, per yeah, day okay. of, of sacrificed people. 3 million pounds of flesh and bone. Yes. Okay, nice. With the average cow weighing about 1,000 pounds, the modern plant processes about 9 million pounds per day, or three times as much flesh and bone. So the modern meat processing plant three to does one. more processing throughput than the Aztec temple, okay. which is a very grisly comparison, but it's still fascinating. fascinating. Okay. <laughs> but I want to know, using Aztec blades, would it have been possible to dismember and process even a third of what a modern plant does today? Put on a coat. Yes. In order to simulate the bloody aftermath of a human sacrifice, Manuel has set up a demonstration. Show me the beef. Okay. Yes. How much does this weigh? About uh, 150 pounds. So that's about a person. Yes, it, it, it here. Perfect. And let's do it. Okay, so after sacrifice, now dismemberment. I'm using a stone blade to cut the flesh off this carcass. This is doing a pretty good job. Yes. Just like the Aztecs did. This specimen may be meatier than a human, but there's nothing like cutting some muscle and severing a few tendons to get a sense of the tremendous effort and manpower involved. Watch your fingers. Yeah. Oh, he's got good articulation. I'll tell you, it's a lot easier slicing watermelons. I'm sure many vegetarians are now in shock and awe. And I apologize to all butchers of the world for making a serious mess. Since I'm clearly not a butcher, and I don't have the surgical skills of the Aztecs, I decide to finish the job with some modern technology. And remember, this is just one piece of one carcass. The Aztecs would have had to process over 20,000 a day. Okay. You made it. <sighs> All right. A lot of work. A lot of work and a very labor intensive this yes, procedure. Very. Manuel tells me it's possible that the Aztecs possess the means and manpower to assemble 80,000 victims. But killing and dismembering that many human beings and inside the time frame described by the Spanish doesn't seem possible. The Aztecs would have had to sacrifice one victim every two minutes at each of their 19 principal temples. Around the clock, and for four straight days. Instead, Manuel thinks that some Spanish codices have to be considered more accurate than others. Three codices coincide in the 80,400 number we have discussed. Okay. Another source says 60,000, and the Codex Telidan Remensis says 20,000. 
Oh, so even within the codices, we have a discrepancy. We have a discrepancy. So and and okay. big discrepancy because yeah. from eighty thousand to twenty thousand for the four days. Manuel explains that twenty thousand sacrifices over four days will leave about six minutes for each sacrifice. A tall order, but more within the realm of possibility. You think twenty thousand people per four days is the maximum possible number? Yes, considering the parallel nineteen temples working together. Yeah. Manuel says when it comes to the Spanish chronicles and their account of Aztec sacrifice, it's important not to take the numbers at face value. For example, one Spanish soldier insisted he counted 136,000 skulls on the main skull rack of Tenochtitlan. Just imagine you would need like a kind of Empire State Building with craniums yes. to have that kind of amount. I don't believe that they could have the time in the middle of the conquest and doing battles yes. to count the, the, the skulls. So the numbers we read about, Manuel, whether it's 20,000 or 80,000, were really for dramatic effect, not right. for a literal interpretation of this many people slaughtered on this many days. Not exactly. Most archaeologists now agree that the Spanish accounts are exaggerated and that the exact scale of Aztec human sacrifice is likely unknowable. However, whatever the exact number may have been, the imagery and extent of the Aztecs' ritual violence and mass killings still shocks us today. The blood on their altars may no longer feed their gods, 